few words on the basic market context in, in which we find ourselves. I think when we, when we last met up, I think, every, and I was last here, it was still back in this context of high and volatile food prices, and there was a, an awful lot of concern about what the implications of high food prices would be for the poor, for food security in general, and where the prospects were for, for where we were going with markets. Uh, maybe that's something that we can come to in terms of lessons learned from that, that experience. But the current context that we're looking at is much calmer food markets. We've seen strong harvests for main food crops, abundant stocks for cereals and oil seeds, so prices have come down. Uh, as many of you will be aware, prices for meat and dairy products have come down uh, from, from high levels to, to quite low levels. There may have been some overshooting in that because of, uh, because of factors such as the, the Russian import, import ban. Uh, and that's led to a lot of policy concern, particularly within Europe and particularly within France, about meat and dairy markets. Another big change that we're seeing is, as everybody knows now, low oil prices. And uh, low oil prices reduce costs of production directly. But at current oil prices, First, the production of first-generation biofuels is not profitable without government mandates and support. There's no economic reason, independent economic reason, for growing biofuels, uh, for growing food crops for, for biofuels. So that's just purely mandate-driven. And then the other context is that we're looking at weak economic growth uh, globally. Uh, I'll give you just a, a few um, highlights uh, of the outlook. Uh, we expect that real food prices over the next 10 years will decline slightly. Um, but we still expect that they'll remain above levels that they were at before the 2007-8 price crisis. So we think that the, that the prices in the low period of the early 2000s were, were very, very low indeed. It's, it's unlikely that prices will return to such low levels but we don't think that we're looking at a situation where prices are going to take off. The, the key, a key point we'd see is structurally, we see changing relative prices because uh, the consumption of food staples is reaching the saturation point in many, although of course not all countries, but globally, the, uh, the major emerging economies are, are consuming plenty of, of food staples. The, the, the extra demand is not coming from there. Where the extra demand is coming for, from is for, for protein. And so we're seeing, we expect to see meat and dairy prices increasing relative to crop prices because of higher in incomes and increased protein demand. And then we expect the knock on effect where the demand for feeds, so coarse grains and oil seeds, will increase relative to, to food prices. As I say, we're looking at calmer markets, but there's a risk of resurgent volatility. I'll say something about that later. And then another factor that we're looking at is that a large number of countries don't have much of a comparative advantage in producing the main temperate products. We see a large number of countries with incomes growing, tending to import more, so diffuse imports across a large number of countries. But still, a fairly concentrated group of countries accounting for the, the, the bulk share of exports of major commodities. Here's the graph which just shows that, that point that I made before. With our projections for cereals, dairy, meat, and oilseed prices, you see we're looking at more or less flat to declining lines, right? In the projection period, of course, we can't, we can't project where things are going to turn, right? So, and you always get straight lines on these, on these projections, but overall, we don't see a structural tendency for them to go downwards much or, up, or upwards much. Um, uh, but we, we expect them to be higher than they were in the early 2000s here. Now, the question is, is this a new normal? And the answer is, well, yes, it is, if your frame of reference is the early 2000s. But if you take a very, very long-run perspective, and this is looking at the, 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 the real uh, maize price in the United States over a 100-year period, what you'll see is that prices have come down over a long period of time. And if you take the view that, that prices were below trend for a period in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, you could say that what we're seeing is not, not inconsistent with this kind of broad tendency for, 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 for supply to match up, to match with, with demand. And I think um, and a couple of key points. One is we don't think 
that we're in some Malthusian world where we're not going to grow enough food and that prices will kind of take off and keep increasing over a period of years. That's, uh, I think that's a key uh, uh, message, uh, message in there. Um, but I'll say, I'll say something as well about the continued, the continued volatility that we might nevertheless ex experience. On these, these graphs, we can't, we can't project when, you know, when we're going to face shocks, but we will, for sure, we will face them. The interesting thing is that as stocks have recovered and supply has responded, markets over the last five years have been much less volatile than they were during this period of high food prices. So we're looking actually at a period of low volatility. And it's amazing, you can go to a lot of meetings and everybody says, yes, but prices are very volatile, but very volatile. Well, not really if you look at the current, the last five years compared with the, the, five, years, the five years before. And I think, just coming back to that earlier graph, there's, I think if, if there's one thing that everybody un, uh, underestimated, it was the supply response to high food prices. So uh, in the seven years before food prices spiked in 2007-8, Cereal production grew by 9%, total of 9% over seven years. It grew by, I think it was about 18%, almost double that rate in the seven years after food price crisis. So that was an extra 370 million tons of cereals arriving on world food markets. So uh, I think the resilience and responsiveness of the, of the food system has been underestimated. This was on food price volatility. It's come down. And this is uh, the graph we show to explain our straight lines. So... This is our, if we take nominal maize price, this is, this is our central projection. But we integrate uncertainty analysis into our projection. So I gave you the mean, and the mean is a flat straight line. But what we say is, if we take historical variations in oil prices, exchange rates, economic growth rates, and yields, so and we look at the historic variation in those things, and we say, let's assume that that variation continues over the next 10 years into the future. It doesn't increase, just stays at the same rate of historical variation. What kind of spread of prices would we be looking at? And we do a 1,000 simulations where we draw from the distribution of, of all these var variations. And doing that, we get um, a 10 to 90% or an 8 10 to 90 percent range, so an 80 percent confidence interval on prices. And that dotted line just shows one random draw of the 1,000 draws that we make. So what's the take-home message from this? The take-home message is each year, the chance that you stay in that band is 80 percent. So the chance that you stay in that band for 10 years in a row is 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 is 0.8 to the power of 10. It's only about a 1 in 10 chance that you don't have a swing that takes you outside that range at least once in 10 years. And so we are faced with a likelihood of resurgent, resurgent volatility. Uh, we would make the point that price volatility is a fact of life. That's just the way agricultural markets are. But what turns a kind of price swing into a crisis is where governments respond and they do exactly the wrong thing. And they did exactly the wrong thing in 2007-8 where markets were shorted and a number of countries imposed export restrictions which further took uh, product off the markets, panic buying, and a, a number of kind of counterproductive responses. So just to make that point again, food prices are inherently volatile. Uh, consumer prices much less so. We see swings of up to 40% from one year to another in agricultural prices, generally less than 10% uh, in corresponding food uh, food prices. And incidentally, if we look at developing countries, we see similar muting of some of the impacts, uh, not, not because of this markup from the farm to the retail level, but because of the, the kind of insulation, the natural insulation of some markets. We see less, less volatility that's coming from overseas if those markets are naturally insulated. Overall, across the world, we see uh, per capita consumption growing modestly, if you look at that map, you'll see particularly modestly in sub-Saharan Africa in our baseline projections. This isn't, this isn't, you know, this isn't destiny. There's, there are ways of changing these things, but that's on current trends. Um, but the, the centers of per capita production growth differ. Uh, that the areas where consumption growth is per capita is growing and the areas where production potential exists, they're not the same. 
looking ahead, we will need more trade, not less trade. Um, we see the Americas dominating export export growth, and we see uh, there's a story here about Africa where there's very little change in Africa because of population growth on current trends. Increasing meat demand. Uh, I'll move over to that one. I, I think, but that's a, a, a story we could we could discuss. What we did is we we took our 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 projections for markets and said, well, this implies a certain availability of production and hence an availability of calories in each country. And what we've done is we've said, well, looking at calorie availability and assuming that access to those calories doesn't change, the distribution doesn't change, what would that imply for undernourishment as measured by the FAO indicator? So the FAO has an indicator of undernourishment that looks at calorie availability in the country, says, if this is the distribution of calories, let's, let's to, do a survey to see what the distribution of access to those calories looks like, and then they compute undernourishment. Well, what we do is we say, let's keep the distribution the same, but take our projections for total availability forward. And then what you see is you see uh, a reduction in undernourishment, but it doesn't make a sharp inroad into it. And there's a big issue in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's virtually no change in the in the total numbers of undernourished, the Indian the incidence, excuse me, comes down, but the proportion, so, sorry, the, yeah, the, the proportion and the incidence comes down, but the total numbers show very little change because of population growth. The point here is that it's not about growing more food. Just growing more food and making more food available won't do it. It's fundamentally it's an access question. Now. Uh, a question was made about smallholders. We can perhaps come to, to that one. But if we look at the process of agricultural growth, we've seen as countries have been developing, in many cases, they've been shedding labor from the agricultural sector. And what we do is we take uh, projections for non-agricultural growth from the IMF we take our own projections for what we think agricultural growth will be looking at. Most people think there's more potential for more rapid growth in, in globally in non-agricultural sectors and say, well, just on current trends, what would that mean for employment? Now, just that more rapid growth in other sectors would itself draw out. So I'm not talking about pushing people out of agriculture. I'm talking about at least 200 million people just on trends, or on projected trend growth rates being drawn out of agriculture into other sectors. And one thing we'd say is that, in many cases, policies have not really sought to smooth that. They've actually, in a sense, what they try is try to put a break on it. Um, that's our kind of outlook at the global level. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we'll be looking at the outlook on, uh, on African markets with a particular focus on food markets. And there are some mega trends that, we, that we'll be looking to investigate. And, one is the, the role that global food and energy prices are, pl are playing in the development of these markets. Uh, there's uh, a scramble for land that is taking place in agriculture, but it's not the same as the scramble for land that everybody expected in 2008. And a lot of what's taking place is internal investment in land from Africans, from Africans themselves. And so we'll be investigating a lot of the structure of that demand for land. Problems with land degradation, this issue of youth bulge and employment challenges, um, it's very difficult given the huge demographic challenge that Africa faces. It's, it's, it's difficult, even if they're making rapid progress in production and productivity and so forth, the population uh, growth means that compared with other continents, the numbers, the numbers are inevitably not going to look as good as they do for other, con other continents. The role of income growth and distribution, climate variability, and the role of, of ICT. These will be things that we're looking at, focusing on a, a, how important are they, but B, how amenable are these different things to, to policy action. Just a, a few words on how governments are responding. Uh, I think it's worth, uh, it's worth emphasizing this because uh, in many cases, uh, people still have a picture of policies in OECD countries that's a couple of decades, decades out of date. I mean, there have been huge changes in the structure and the level of support in OECD countries. So back in the late 90s, at least a third of agricultural revenues came from transfers, either from con consumers, so there was high, farmers got higher prices because consumers were paying higher prices, or through taxpayer, <coughs> tra taxpayer finance transfers. 
that share has, has about halved to about 18% now. Uh, and what we've seen is that the larger emerging economies are now starting to protect their markets in the way that, uh, that OECD countries did. So, uh, and in fact, the, the total value of transfers across the OECD area just to producers is about 250 billion euros a year. In China, it, China alone, it's getting up to $300 billion a year. So these are huge tectonic shifts in the structure of support. Um, we see the total level of support in billions of, of, of US dollars there. We see this rising support in emerging economies. And not only that, but we see emerging economies tending to rely much more on market distorting instruments in the form of price support and also uh, input subsidies. Um, so just some kind of main conclusions that we that we reached um, related to kind of smoothing the functioning of international food and agriculture markets. We think there's a need for transparent and, and open markets that enables food to get from surplus areas to deficit deficit areas. Uh, a key thing that influences the outlook is productivity, and sustainable productivity growth benefits consumers via lower prices, and it benefits producers too, but it only benefits producers if they're the ones who are participating in the productivity gains. If the price goes down and your cost structure doesn't change, you lose. And we think that we're still in this world where farmers face competitive pressures. That pressure's not gone away. Uh, there are a range of other actions that can influence food availability on markets, reduce post-harvest losses. There was a uh, reduced waste, a comment that was made earlier, less overconsumption. But the point is, none of these factors alone will ensure food security, which we think is more of a, uh, an access issue. We think that phasing out first generation biofuel support would eliminate one of those factors that can turn a food price shock into a, into a crisis. Um, and then, in many cases, market outcomes, they don't reflect, reflect a proper pricing of natural resources. Often water in particular is just not priced and water is not used sustainably. A set of risk management tools that need to be developed to manage price volatility and that efforts to use border measures to do that have not been successful at all. But actually designing those is a, is a big challenge. I think with, with that I'll leave it there. Here's the, the team at OECD who, in fact we've got a, a colleague who's from Bonn here. So that's the team at OECD. There's a team at FAO as well. And you're very welcome to visit our website.